our new exhibition, Pen in the World, 12 Decades at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. And this is an exhibition that was put together by a group of students in a Halpern Rogath curatorial seminar that I taught with Professor David Brownlee in the Department of Art History um, about a year and a half ago. There were nine students in the class and they did all the research, selected the objects, we identified themes, organization. The exhibition really completely comes out of that class. So it really is, it really is very much the students' work. It was a mixture of graduate and undergraduate students and all of them knew the museum, but they came to know it much, much better by um, the archival research that they did to generate the material that's in the exhibition. It's organized in sort of four areas. As you come in, you're first confronted with this fabulous photograph of the museum just about the time that it opened in December of 1899. The photograph is taken from Franklin Field, which was at that time just wooden stands. Again, this is 1899. And then next to it, we have this model, which is taken from similar vantage point with obviously the newer Franklin Field. And it shows this part of the building that corresponds to the photograph but it also shows the rest of the building so you can understand what a complicated building this is. So then we start to tell the story of the museum by first telling the story of the architecture. All right, and then one of the things that everybody loves is the Wedgwood plate. It was produced by Wedgwood in 1929. It's one of a set of 12 that show important Penn buildings and the museum is right there in the middle and then around it are little vignettes of earlier Penn buildings when it was in Center City. This is about education and uh, the education of school children but also adults and older students was really part of the museum's plan from the very beginning and you can see up there in, that, in the text panel there's a group of school children visiting the museum in 1912. So we wanted to highlight some of those activities and hope that the text panel would suggest a little bit too, the, that there were non-traditional students. In the teens and 20s, th uh, 30s, I guess, 20s, 30s, the museum had a couple of magazines for children, and one of them was called The Spade, and it was about archaeological discoveries all over the world, not just ours. So much archival information, and of course it was that information that we used to generate the information that's in the text panels, but the archival stuff itself is fascinating. The wonderful exhibit designers, Kate Quinn particularly, came up with the idea of creating these desks. There's a desk here and a table in the next gallery uh, to put the archival material on. So instead of having it framed on the wall, so it just looks like just a letter, here it just enlivens it so much more. This is one of my favorites. These are household expenses and the payroll from Harriet, Boy's, Harriet Boyd Hawes excavations at Gornia. And you can see over there that it lists, you know, bread, wine, fish. And then over here is the payroll. So the men's names are listed here in Greek, of course. And then how much they got paid. But over on the right, there are a few little comments. And one is called no good. Um, and another one was dismissed, no good. Um, and one is called good boy. So there are little uh, additions here. This actually is object number one, um, <laughs> which is... Uh, an axe, uh, actually from, um, from New Jersey. But that is the object in the collection that is number one. This is a pangolin scaly anteater fighting jacket from Borneo. And this is a matching hat. And this photograph here actually shows the Borneo gallery as it was installed in 1899. So when the museum opened, you can see some bits and pieces of the gallery here, but we thought it gave you a sense of what the museum was like in the 1890s. Then over here are three pieces, uh, four pieces from uh, Alaska, actually from George Gordon's um, uh, work in Alaska. So this gives you a sort of view into expeditions, and then from there you'll get a view back into here. So you come in here, and the first thing you see as you come into expeditions is this fabulous photograph of the excavations at Nippur in Iraq. That was our first excavation beginning in, well they started in 1887, but they didn't actually start excavating until 1888. So this photograph, it's a famous photograph of Nippur, and it sort of sets the scene for expeditions. Then as you move away, I guess you really have to stop and look at the Apollai headdress. This case is devoted to the uh, objects from the expeditions of William Curtis Farabee. He was in 
many parts of South America, particularly uh, Amazonian areas, it's also in Peru. And this is a headdress from the Apalai people. It's a shaman's headdress. Take a brief look at Nippur. And it is that excavation which produced our cuneiform tablets. And three of those are mounted there. And they're also a series of cylinder seals. And these two pieces, this is a, uh, oh, an impression made in hot and wax. We wouldn't do that now. <laughs> um, of a cylinder seal. And this is a squeeze made of an inscription. If, as in the case of this, the inscription's on a very large piece of marble, this way you can take your squeeze up to your office or wherever, <laughs> or bring it home from the field. We have a wonderful collection of archaeological textiles from Max Ula's excavations at Pachacamac. That was something that we um, very much wanted to, to focus on. There are three textile pieces there. Again, this is archaeological material. It's very dry there, so the material survived. Here's another one of these collections of archival material, very much like the desk. We were trying, that was really supposed to be sort of the directors. This is more, we thought it a little bit more as an active researcher, although it's from different periods. This huge thing here is John Punnett Peter's passport, and you can see that it doesn't have a photograph on it, but it actually describes the shape of his face, how big his nose is, what his eyes are. So I guess you were supposed to sort of put together an image of him based on the description. Clarence Fisher, who was the excavator at Memphis, never really published his finds from Memphis, and that includes the palace of uh, Merenptah, which is in, lower, in the Lower Egyptian Gallery. He did produce this fabulous series of watercolors, so maybe most archaeologists could not do that now, I suppose. Yeah. But it is too bad that he and Gordon had a kind of a falling out, and so in the end the material wasn't completely published. Okay, this is one of my favorites. We can't walk by the red hat. This is a, a, a wool hat made by the Penobscot people of Maine. George Gordon purchased it for us when he was director, and he often did this if he saw something that he thought we should have. We didn't have the funds to purchase it. He would purchase it for us and then would later sell it back to us um, or re reimburse himself, I suppose, um, at the original cost. So this was one of those pieces. These three wooden objects here, the headdress and the wonderful dog, are from um, Henry, Rusher, Henry Usher Hall's ethnographic expedition to the area around Sherboro Island uh, in Sierra Leone in the 1930s. And this little dog shows up in a couple of places. Over on the text panel, there's a photograph of him with, the, with his wood carver because Hall collected not only objects, but he was interested in how these objects were used. So he took a lot of photographs showing them in use. And so we have a picture of little doggy with his wood carver. This is a wonderful Maya vase from the site of Chama. We have a very impressive collection of these, which were excavated uh, by Robert Burkett. Other museums have, have Chama vases, but we have ones which are actually from excavation. And we put in here, actually, this little drawing that Burkett did of Chama and a letter uh, that he wrote to Gordon talking about his discoveries at Chama. So again, we tried to bring the archival material to life.